Hi, my name is Megan Mook, and I specialize in meditation for emotional intelligence. And what that means to me is using meditation as a way to touch in with what it really means to be human, our heart. So kindness, awareness, tenderness, compassion, all of the good qualities that truly differentiate us as humans. There's a lot of meditation traditions. My background is in Buddhism, specifically Tibetan Buddhism, and even more specifically the lineage of the Dalai Lama, which is called the Geluk School of Tibetan Buddhism. So everything that I'm saying is coming from a Buddhist perspective. So much about meditation we think about is mindfulness. And what mindfulness has come to mean, most basically, is awareness. Being aware of the present moment. Traditionally, in the Buddhist context, which is where mindfulness is coming from, there's an added layer, there's a critical component to it. And what it's more than just blanket awareness. It means being aware with a lookout for negative mental states, basically. So, for example, greed or anger or jealousy. That's one part of it. And then the second part is trying to herald in positive states like love and compassion, patience, tolerance. So because mindfulness is such a buzzword right now, as you hear it, play with layering in the more traditional context, which is actually about working with our emotions and growing so that we can really live up to a higher potential as um, humans and not just being aware of our present environment so that we can calm down a little bit so that we continue potentially living in ways that are actually hurting us um, and hurting our humanity. One of the skills involved in being aware is actually being tolerant. And in the Buddhist context, they, they use the word patience. But what patience really means in this, in this context is being tolerant. So tolerant of what? Your day in, little by little, trying to increase your awareness. And the more aware we become, the more in touch or in tune we become to uncomfortable feelings, be it physical or emotional or mental states or environmental. So the trick is, how can we build up our tolerance to this discomfort? One of my favorite definitions of mindfulness comes from a scholar named Kristen Neff, who does a lot of work on self-compassion. And to be honest, I actually haven't even read this quote from her, but I, I heard from another scholar that she defines mindfulness as being fully aware of whatever is arising, so that includes emotions, without over-identifying with it. To be fully aware of whatever's arising without over-identifying with it requires a kind of tolerance. We have to be able to tolerate the feelings of anxiety or depression or sadness. Likewise, we have to be able to tolerate feelings of joy and delight and confidence. I really believe, and I've heard scholars say this, although I haven't read a lot on it, um, but from my own practice, I really believe that where the degree to which we can hold discomfort is directly proportional to the degree to which we can hold pleasure and joy. For myself, I find I can get a little scared around joy. Too much joy makes me uncomfortable. I don't know how to handle it in my body. Sometimes I shut it down. Um, and certainly the same is true with uncomfortable emotions. Um, and we all you know, there's the full range of uncomfortable emotions, anxiety, depression, anger, jealousy. And I think most of us have a couple that we're a little more keyed into, a little more, um, we have like more of a proclivity towards. And throughout my practice, the one, they change. 
it used to be anxiety and now I'm finding threads of depression that I didn't know were there. I think they were there all along. I just, um, now that the anxiety is settled, the depression starts to bubble up, which is great because now that I know, oh, there's some depression in my mind, I can start to address it. I can start to intentionally do things both to heal it and to set up circumstances in my life so that it's less likely to arise. And that brings me to one of the major misconceptions about meditation, which is that it's this isolated thing we do. So we live our life doing whatever we're doing, and then we spend whatever it is, 15 minutes, half hour, an hour a day meditating. And it's this box that then is supposed to help us be more resilient or kind or compassionate or less stressed, whatever it is. But the truth is, in order to be successful here in the meditation, our life, we need to make some changes in our life or just to be aware that the way that we're living also affects our meditation. And the way that we're living affects our meditation's ability to then impact our mind, if that makes sense. So for example, if through my meditations, I start to become aware of some anxiety, well, I can address the anxiety within the context of the meditation, but I'd be better served if I really tackled it from both directions. So if I then start to look at my life, well, what are the factors in my life that might be making me anxious or contributing to the anxiety? Um, have I eaten a good meal today? How much exercise am I getting? What's my environment like? Is it, is it loud? Is it calm? Is it cluttered? Um, is it spacious? What are my relationships like? Are they stressful or are they nurturing? Do I feel threatened or do I feel confident? So the <clears throat> when we become aware through meditation of whatever it is, this being fully aware of whatever is arising, it has the potential to call us to action, to make some other changes in the rest of our life. And then the more we make these small, sweet little changes, the better we can work with whatever's arising in the meditation and the more that the meditation has um, <clears throat> an impact on our life. They start to feed off of each other. Being fully aware requires a tremendous amount of compassion. Inevitably, we're going to become aware of things that hurt us, of things that we've done to hurt other people we become aware of this incongruity between how we think of ourselves or what we value and how we act. And that can be very painful. That dissonance can be so painful that we will often completely disassociate from it. We'll basically ignore it or shelf it or we can underplay its significance, or we can use it as an opportunity to just beat ourselves up, um, turning into some sort of self-loathing. To that end, in no way should an awareness practice, a mindfulness practice, be separate from a compassion practice. They really go hand in hand. And in fact, it's the compassion that keeps us from over-identifying, to go back to that Kristen Neff um, definition. Compassion helps us put things into perspective. It helps us realize that we're hurting, and that's actually not even a problem. It's just how it is. There's some pain, some discomfort right now. Um, compassion also helps us realize that we're not the only ones hurting, which very often that's how we experience our own pain. We think that we alone feel insecure or anxious or overwhelmed or incredibly agitated, whatever it is, when in fact this is what it is to be human. We all have 
these feelings and they peak and they go down and there are different levels for everyone at different times, but we're not alone in it. And when we think that we're alone, when we really get caught in that, it makes the discomfort, the pain, the suffering worse. We as humans are desperate to connect with each other. That's what we are. We're connected, I was gonna say species, but we're a, we're a family. Um, and we've completely gotten away from that. We've, it's in our, our culture, it's as if that's not even part of what it is to be human. Yeah, so compassion practices can help us remember that we're not alone, that we are connected in this shared experience. Compassion practices can also help us learn to mentor ourselves. Mentor is a, a little bit of a sterile word for it. Um, the way I really think of it is to mother ourselves, to be able to show up to ourselves, to our own pain and suffering in the same way that like an idealized mother would show up. Utterly unbothered, unflustered, completely present, completely attuned, delightfully tender, very receptive to know just what we need, what we don't need, spacious, no rushing. We spend so much time looking for other people to mother us or to mentor us, to make us feel better. Um, <clears throat> But the truth of it is, we need to learn, or I should say I need to learn, how to do that better for myself. And that's not to say we don't seek connection with other people, of course we do. But when it comes down to it, we ourselves are, are all we have. Um, and learning to show up for ourselves has a tremendous ability to take that edge off of the, the strong feelings, to somehow make them workable, make them malleable. Now we'll do a meditation basically to encourage ourselves to be present. So while, um, I'm gonna talk you through it a little bit, I'll explain it. And then once we actually start to move into the meditation, um, I really encourage you to not look at me as the visual. Um, you can close your eyes or you can have, um, in the Buddhist tradition, the gaze is half closed and, and down at the floor. And use the sound of my voice as, like, so you feel like you have a companion, a little friend with you. Um, and you can certainly open your eyes and check in with the image here if you start to feel lost or uncomfortable. Um, but it really is an, an inward facing practice. So give yourself the opportunity once we start the actual meditation, it'll be clear when that starts, um, to go inward and kind of disconnect from me here on a screen. So get comfortable. You can sit up as well as you um, comfortably can. If you're sitting in a chair, have both feet flat on the floor, try not to lean back. Having your hands halfway up on your thighs is fine. And again, you can now adjust your eyes, either closing your eyes or having them half open and down at the floor. And to begin, take three very deep and full breaths. And if you feel the impulse to move at any point, say to roll your shoulders back or your head around or to stretch in any way. And give yourself permission to do that at any point. And also give yourself permission to take deep breaths at any moment. And 
Relax your temples. Relax your eyes. And whether or not your eyes are open or closed, see if you can draw your eyes back and soften them into the sockets. Relax your jaw, your tongue. Relax your shoulders, your stomach. Let yourself soften some of the armor that we all wear. And very gently, very sweetly, start to move your awareness to your breath. And keep relaxing but at the same time, start to really tune in to the physical sensations of your breath. What do you feel when you breathe in? What do you feel physically when you breathe out? And is there some kind of pleasure, some nice feeling about breathing in and breathing out? And can you use this pleasure to help you relax even more? And at the same time, to help you feel more clearly exactly what it feels like to breathe. Lean into the pleasurable sensations. And at the same time, keep feeling specifically each in-breath, each out-breath. And see if you can make a link in your mind. The feelings of your breath, these concrete physical sensations, they're the same as the physical sensations of emotions. So as you feel yourself breathe in and you feel all those sensations and then you breathe out and you feel all the sensations of breathing out. The sensations come, the sensations go. And as we feel them, we practice building up tolerance, building up the ability to be present of just what we're feeling without disassociating, without beating ourselves up. Just feeling 
and leaning into the pleasure when we become aware of it. Take a few more moments here to practice being truly present to the physical sensations of your breath. When your awareness moves away to thoughts or memories, just come back to the pleasures of breathing, to the practice of being present. So if you like, you can begin to add in a phrase and silently in your own mind as you breathe in saying, may I learn to be present. Saying the phrase as you breathe in and trying to tune in with a little more clarity to exactly what you're feeling as you breathe out. And as you breathe in and out, see if you can guide your presence to a place that's very relaxed, very fluid, gentle, flexible, and also very clear, very much in tune and aware with what's happening, with what you're feeling. And all the while, try to filter this experience of breathing, this practice of presence, through the lens of pleasure. Lean in to what feels nice with each in-breath and each out-breath. Practice together like this for just a few more minutes. And because it's just a short time, really invest in it. Be sweet and kind and attentive as you practice being present to your breath and to anything else that arises.
And gradually begin to deepen your breath. Stay present and engaged. And as you feel ready, take a very deep breath in. The slight pause at the top. The long breath out. And take a few moments to feel good about the practice of being present. And the practice of connecting to yourself. Connecting to your heart, to your humanity. And if you like, think of one tiny little thing you can do today or tomorrow to encourage yourself to be present, to be kind. Let it be something that's very easy to do, simple, that you don't have any resistance towards. And if you like, resolve to do it. Because presence, compassion, all of these are practices. They're not attitudes. We have to practice them little by little, increasing in skill and capacity. And again, whenever you feel ready, take a very deep breath in and a nice long breath out. opening your eyes at any point, taking a few moments to adjust and transition, and building in some time to transition before you begin the rest of your day. Thanks for watching.